Um, I think there may be more people come in, but as it is, we'll get started. So what I will do is just you happy to get started? Yeah. I'll just um give me my second. That's all right, we'll, we'll do that. Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, so welcome. Thank you for coming today to this presentation. Uh, before we get going, however, I do want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters across this land. Um, now known as Australia, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as any Aboriginal people with us here today. I acknowledge the elders past and present for their wisdom and guidance in ensuring cultural survival and caring for country and for their continuing contributions. That's not up there. <laughs> so their continuing contributions to our nation. Elders in the future for their hopes, for the hopes that we place on them um, to guide us and to continue this legacy. Here we are on the lands of the Widjwal Viable Peoples of Bunjalung Nation. And I also want to acknowledge the custodians of the lands of the, on which all of the people who are on the Zoom are joining us from today. But I also want to remind us that this is actually Reconciliation Week, a time to reach out, learn from each other, learn the truth of our shared history and take steps to connect and heal. The theme this year is now more than ever, and that's a reflection of the need for all of us to do more after the disastrous refer referendum last year, and that we all need to, truth telling is an essential part of making, of reconciling and making progress for our country. Today's seminar is about tobacco, and a part of the truth is that commercial tobacco was introduced into this country and introduced to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people by the colon colonial um, governments, and that this has caused and continues to cause considerable harm and suffering. However, on a more positive note, um, we also need to celebrate the amazing diversity of the cultural heritage we gain as a nation from the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples who have cared for this country for at least 60,000 years. So I pay my respects. Now, I will move along housekeeping <laughs> on a very different note. Um, I just want to say I really mean the word of, of that acknowledgement of the country. It's really important that we all do better. Um, tea and coffee are available outside. In bathrooms are available just out here in the foyer. Um, the seminar today is being audio and video recorded. So um, if you don't want to be uh, recorded, then you will not be able to speak. Um, but please put your phones on silent, stay on mute until the end, and at the end we'll have a, a facilitated Q&A time. Caitlin Notley, I want a big welcome to Caitlin. Um, she's the Director of the Lifespan Health Research Centre at the University of East Anglia, and you can all read that uh, there. She's an amazing researcher leading research on tobacco related to pregnancy, postpartum, as well as a range of other areas, but really doing some wonderful work. I've known Kate now for a couple of years. We bumped to each other at conferences and we recently met in Edinburgh and others. 
very excited when I heard she was coming to Australia for the conference in Brisbane later this week. So I've invited her to come here to speak this, to this seminar today. So Caitlin, I think I can hand over to you. Oh, sorry, no, I'm not gonna read that. That was the... Uh... Thanks so much, um, Megan. Um, it's really a, a huge honor to be here today. And thank you for that kind um, introduction. Um, I, I can't pretend uh, to fully understand the history of the colonialization of Australia, but I want to acknowledge um, Reconciliation Week. Megan has educated me a little <laughs> in the car journey on the way here and the, the co commitment to truth telling and doing better, I, I uphold as a moral principle. So um, just wanted to say that before I start. <laughs> Um, so I'm really delighted um, to have this opportunity to talk to you about the Baby Breathe um, study. Um, Megan has asked me particularly to talk about um, the way in which uh, we have developed the intervention for this trial, which um, I hope is going to be of great interest to you. And I really hope that we're going to have a really good discussion on, on what this um, approach could mean and could look like um, within your context here in Australia. Um, so I really want to acknowledge um, all the team that are involved in this study. It's a huge team, some of whom are named on the screen here. And the study is funded by the National Institute for Health Research, um, which is a government source of funding um, in the UK. Um, so this is a little bit about where I come from. Um, I lead the Addiction Research Group um, at the University of East Anglia, beautiful campus shown here. It is actually a lovely rural campus. We have a big lake. Um, if anyone is ever in the UK, we would be delighted to host you. It's a lovely place to visit. Um, and it's based in Norwich, the little place that I've circled on the map there, which is southeast of London, about 100 miles um, from London. Most people in the UK don't know where Norwich is, so I thought I would educate you on that um, this far away. Um, so a bit of background, and uh, just to sort of get us in the, the swing of things, um, in the UK, our population level smoking prevalence is a bit higher than I think you have here in Australia as a general population. Just under 14% um, are, are, are the current figures. This is data from the Smoking Toolkit study, which is led by colleagues at University College London, um, which is a, a nationally representative survey, survey collecting data every month. So we're really lucky in the UK that we've got really good population level um, data on smoking prevalence. But um, this data kind of hides huge inequalities and differences um, within different groups. So this is some data from a, a study that we actually published just a couple of weeks ago. Um, again, using data from the Smoking Toolkit study, we looked particularly at women of reproductive age. Um, so if you look at the graph at the top there, graph A on smoking, you can see um, the top two lines um, that we've seen a decline in um, population level smoking prevalence amongst women, but much higher than the general population. So around one in four women of reproductive age are smoking tobacco regularly still. And you can see that the top line, the pink line there is um, women in the lower socioeconomic status. So we've really positively seen a, a sharper decline amongst women in that socioeconomic group. But actually in the last year or two, we've seen a slight increase in levels of tobacco smoking amongst women um, in the higher socioeconomic groups of reproductive age. So we don't really know what's going on there, but it's clearly something that we'll be um, watching um, really closely. Um, so the kind of idea around Baby Breathe was, we knew that there's quite high smoking amongst women of reproductive age. Um, at the time, um, about in, back in about 2018, uh, there, at then we knew that around 22% of people were reporting smoking in the 12 months before they fell pregnant. Really positively, many women do manage to quit smoking during pregnancy. Um, approximately half, we think, will quit by going cold turkey. So they quit with no support whatsoever. They don't tell anyone that they've been smoking and they manage to remain smoke-free for their pregnancy. So that's fantastic but possibly is one of the risk factors for returning back to smoking postpartum because many women believe that they are not vulnerable to, to relapse. They were able to quit quite easily by themselves. So unfortunately from data, we know that up to 75% of women who quit smoking for pregnancy or during pregnancy will be likely to restart smoking sometime in the 12 months after their baby is born. In the UK, um, we have quite good services to support pregnant women to quit smoking. They're not 
always engaged with, but the, 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 the sort of um, strong approach to smoking and cessation in pregnancy is there in our policy and in our practice and service provision. But we don't have any routine support at all to help women stay smoke free after they've had their baby. So although we've got this strong policy focus on smoking cessation in pregnancy, unfortunately, it sometimes means that we forget to think about relapse um, as an important problem. But of course, postpartum relapse is a huge problem. You know, if we can support women to stay smoke free after they've had their baby, not only are we improving health outcomes for the mum and for her baby, but also for the wider family. We know that um, children born to mothers who smoke are more than twice as likely to go on and start smoking themselves later in life. So there's that kind of wider prevention angle as well. So that's why baby breed's important. I thought I'd just take you back a bit to, to, to where this came from. Um, I was fortunate to um, be funded by the Society for the Study of Addiction back in 2015 um, to work on a program of work around smoking relapse prevention. I started with a, a systematic review of all the qualitative evidence we had at the time um, from women who had returned to smoking after um, pregnancy. And I synthesized all the evidence to try and understand some of the reasons for relapse. So these are the kind of targets that we might be thinking about if we were de um, designing an intervention. So there's a, a, a huge range of psychosocial reasons why women might return to smoking. So physically, um, we, we knew from the qualitative evidence, some women talked about immediate return of cravings as soon as they'd had their baby almost. There's a strong correlation with breastfeeding. So women who decide not to breastfeed are more likely to return to smoking, very strong association there. Psychologically, um, we knew from the cessation literature that women told us that they are very motivated to quit smoking during pregnancy, often because they know the baby's inside them and they want to protect their unborn fetus. Um, they know that smoking in pregnancy is, it can be very damaging, um, but that means that their motivation is completely changed as soon as the baby is born. For some women, it's like, well, you know, I'm not worrying about that baby inside me anymore, so the motivation um, to stay smoke-free reduces. Um, socially, having a partner or someone in the household is a very strong predictor of, of postpartum relapse. Obviously, incredibly difficult for women to stay smoke free if their partner is smoking. So that's the kind of norm in their social environment. Culturally, there's very strong norms around smoking, particularly um, amongst uh, women um, from particular um, socioeconomic groups, um, wh where sometimes um, smoking remains the norm um, within families. And then an aspect that I'm really particularly interested in as an academic is around um, women's sense of identity. So for many women, um, tobacco smoking can be associated with their kind of sense of themselves as a young independent woman. woman. It might be something they engage in as a behaviour, you know, when they're socialising with friends, for example, pre-pregnancy. And so postpartum, going back to smoking can almost be like, a, you know, regaining a sense of, of yourself as you were before pregnancy, which for many women um, is very important. And then of course, also aspects such as stress and um, depression and anxiety, women can come to form links between tobacco smoking as a way of coping with stress and think that relapsing is, is going to be a, a positive coping mechanism for them. So very, very complex reasons in which women might relapse back to smoking. So um, we went on to um, receive some funding from the Medical Research Council to try and address this issue, to develop an intervention to support um, postpartum relapse um, prevention. We worked with um, participants, so with um, pregnant women and postpartum women, with their partners, and also with the healthcare providers looking after women during pregnancy and postpartum, so midwives um, and health visitors in the UK. So the PRES study then um, came before Baby Breathe. It was a study where we aimed to kind of map those determinants of um, returning to smoking, to specifically look at some of the behaviour change techniques that we might use within an intervention to address those determinants, and then to work on uh, a prototype intervention. So we used focus groups and interviews with women and partners and healthcare professionals, asking them what they thought would be helpful um, and what would be feasible um, and uh, accessible for implementation as well. And then we did a, a phase of work modeling the prototype intervention with postpartum ex-smokers, kind of testing and retesting the approach before we went on to define the intervention um, 
ultimately then to test within a, a randomized controlled trial. So we, we followed the MRC framework for the development of, of complex interventions, which really starts from this early phase, um, evidence synthesis, qualitative work towards them defining a, a, a intervention for testing. Um, so this was the first part of the study, a, a review of behavior change techniques. We looked um, at existing studies of postpartum um, interventions. Uh, we included 32 studies in that review, six of which were deemed to be effective at supporting women to stay smoke free. None of these were conducted in the UK, but we looked at them to see which kind of specific techniques those interventions might have used that we might learn from. And we identified six promising behavior change techniques, which included things like um, problem solving, giving information about health consequences, you know, telling the truth to women about the consequences of, of going back to smoking, um, information about social and environmental consequences. So this is kind of behavior change language, um, but, you know, specific targets that we, we thought might be useful within an intervention. So we published this work um, across a couple of articles, um, one on the way in which we've developed the intervention and another um, focus specifically on postpartum um, identity. So I don't expect you to read this and it's way too much information, but just to show that in developing the intervention, we, we, we use behavior change theory and everything as part of the intervention. So the resources that we developed are based on specific behavior change techniques to address those particular determinants of postpartum relapse. So um, we should be able to kind of clearly see that each part of the intervention addresses a particular part of the behavior and then hopefully has an impact on the outcome of, of staying smoke free. So this is an overview of the baby brief intervention pathway. So it's a complex intervention the idea with this um, that we've heard very clearly from our qualitative work is that um, different things work better for different people. You know, for some people, being reminded at all about smoking would, would be a trigger and would be unhelpful. Other people really wanted the acknowledgement and wanted to talk about it all the time. So the idea with a complex intervention is there's a toolkit of resources and people can pick and choose from things that are going to most support them to um, change and sustain the change of their behavior. So the baby breathe intervention um, starts in the um, antenatal period. Um, in the UK, we have uh, two mandated contacts with health visitors who I think are called child and family health nurses in Australia. Um, one of those mandated contacts happens around 28 weeks of pregnancy. And the idea is then that the health visitor talks to the woman to help her prepare um, for the, the baby that's on its way. Um, so at that time point, we have um, a specific amount of funded time for the health visitors to also focus on smoking relapse. So we identify women who've quit smoking for pregnancy and the health visitor specifically praises her for having managed to quit smoking and talks to her about the, her vulnerability to smoking relapse postpartum. And the idea with that visit is that most women who quit smoking for pregnancy do not believe they're at risk of returning to smoking. So it's really to help women prepare to, to, to be able to deal with those risks and think about how they're going to respond to triggers um, for returning to smoking. So to prepare them. Um, and then women are given access in, in, in intervention group to some of our digital and remote resources. So we developed a website um, and an app. Um, which gives tailored personalized support, things like um, a calculator of the time the woman has been smoke free and the health benefits for herself and also for her um, baby. Um, and then at, around the time of birth, women are sent in the post what we call the baby breathe box. We've got a nice physical example of it here for you. So it's designed to arrive through the letterbox. It's a physical gift that women receive with lots more information, resources, um, nicotine replacement therapy and advice on how to use it if the woman is experiencing cravings rather than returning to smoking and some kind of gifts and encouragement to for women to reward themselves for the important um, behaviour change they've made of, of managing to stay smoke free. And then the second mandated health visitor contact happens usually around um, 10 to 14 days postpartum. This is the time when 
kind of the care is transferred from the midwives through to the health visiting service. And at that time point, the health visitor again praises the woman for staying smoke free, offers um, help, information and support and signposts back to the digital resources. We also have a text message system that is triggered to start from the date of birth. So women receive direct um, to their mobile phones, um, positive, supportive texts and hints and tips um, mapped to the behaviour change techniques to help them stay smoke free. So one of the most important things about Baby Breathe is the supportive um, approach and recognising with women the, the behaviour change they've made. Because women told us in our previous work that, you know, quitting smoking was really hard. And once they'd quit, no one else ever mentioned it again. No one said to them, well done, or told them about, you know, the, the health benefits of the same smoke free. So it's acknowledging that behaviour um, change is one of the most important aspects. And then women have access, ongoing access to the digital and remote aspects of the intervention for up to 12 months after their baby has been born. And the health visitor, uh, any subsequent health visitor appointments is again meant to just acknowledge and talk to the woman about um, staying smoke free. Um, so for some women, they might have seen their health visitor a number of times, depending on particular circumstances and vulnerabilities. Other women wouldn't have had any further contacts in that 12 months. Um, so within this baby breed study, it's a randomised controlled trial. We recruited women working with um, midwifery services. So midwives would identify women who had managed to quit smoking for or during the pregnancy. And then they would be randomised to receive either usual care, which is generally nothing around relapse prevention, although health visitors do talk to women about safer sleeping um, and the risk of sudden infant death syndrome if they're smoking in the home or to receive the baby breathe um, intervention, as I've just talked about. So some of the um, intervention components, um, just to say that this trial was funded and started in January 2020. Of course, we immediately went into COVID lockdown. So we had to make huge changes to the protocol to um, enable this trial to be delivered completely remotely if necessary. So originally our protocol was face-to-face -face support with the health visitors, um, recruiting women used by midwives, you know, in, in, in appointments. We amended our protocol to allow for completely remote um, recruitment to the trial and also for the intervention to be delivered completely remotely. So health visitors could deliver the intervention by video call. Um, we used carbon monoxide monitoring, monitoring to assess women's um, smoke-free status on entering the trial. We couldn't do that face-to-face, -face, so we sent women the individual use CO monitors, the ICO monitor, to check their eligibility. And because this was a really new technology that had happened just because of COVID, we, made, uh, we took advantage of it. And so women in the intervention group were also encouraged to CO monitor themselves if they wanted to just to see that their carbon monoxide levels had stayed low. Um, so we've got some really fascinating data on that. Um, this is just some screenshots of the website and the app. You can see it's all kind of very encouraging and um, supportive um, information and some of the tailored aspects, the health timeline, a savings calculator, so women can see how much money they were saving by staying smoke free. The app, um, it was just a fantastic thing. You know, it took so much work to develop it. Um, we worked with a team of students, actually, who, who kind of um, programmed the app over, over a, the course of a summer and has lots of kind of gamification in it and that you could kind of earn rewards for the time you were smoke free, that kind of thing. Um, so there's the baby brief box and you're very welcome to have a look at it. This is some of the contents of the box. So the nicotine gum, health information advice. We do give information on nicotine replacement and also e-cigarettes. In the UK, we do use e-cigarettes as part of a harm reduction approach to smoking cessation or to staying smoke free. So perhaps controversially, we do say to women, if you're really experiencing cravings to smoke, try an e-cigarette or, or nicotine replacement um, instead. And then some of the aspects that women could pick and choose if they wanted to, reward charts and journals, um, photos, a photo of their baby they could put on the fridge as a reminder, that kind of thing. So this is the trial flow diagram. Um, we consent women um, during pregnancy. They did a CO monitor reading to confirm that they were smoke free. 
Um, and then we randomized them just after the 28 week point in pregnancy. So we did that to make sure, to try to make sure we weren't randomizing women who might have adverse pregnancy outcomes. Um, so women were randomized to the intervention or to usual care. Around the time of birth, they received the um, intervention components that were triggered from the date of birth. And then we followed up women at six and 12 months. The primary outcome of the study is sustained smoking abstinence at 12 months. And we use the, the um, CO monitors to verify that smoking abstinence. Um, so this is our consult diagram. We've completed recruitment. Um, uh, but we're still in follow-up for the trial, so I don't have final, final findings to show you as yet, um, but we will be finishing um, follow-up in November this year. You can see we screened huge numbers of women, over 8,000 women. Um, early on, lots of the women we screened didn't meet inclusion criteria because they weren't in an area where we had trained health visitors to deliver the intervention. We actually changed that criteria. Um, early on so that we could recruit women remotely across anywhere in the UK. Um, so that kind of got us over that exclusion of, of having to be in an area because we could deliver the intervention remotely too. So women had to provide consent to be contacted because we many of them we kind of first identified very early in pregnancy and then went on to provide full consent around 28 weeks in their pregnancy. So we had quite a big dropout from that initial point of consent to contact through to providing full consent because we just lost people and they go off the radar despite our best um, efforts. So we've randomised um, 887 women equally to the baby booth package or treatment as usual. We're currently in follow-up um, and just over 500 women so far have reached the 12-month follow-up time. So just a little bit more on how we've adapted to be flexible in our recruitment, follow-up and intervention delivery. As I said, initially we planned to recruit by midwives physically at our trial recruitment sites. We were going to do in-person CO monitoring and then have the intervention delivered face-to-face -face by health visitors. We had to adapt because of COVID, so we used some online targeted advertising as well as working with midwives. Um, initially in trial areas, but then across the whole of the UK, we used the remote CO monitors and we adapted um, to allow the health visitors to deliver the intervention remotely. Actually, a lot of the health visiting standard care was being delivered remotely at that time. So it was a part of the routine contact or sometimes it was done as an additional contact. Um, and then we further adapted because we were struggling recruiting to the trial to allow members of the broader health visiting team to be trained to deliver the intervention. So initially it was very much just health visitors that were delivering the intervention, but we used health, the equivalent of healthcare assistance as well as part of the trial. So we're gonna have some interesting data, I think, on whether there's any differences in terms of the, the people who were um, delivering the intervention. And we also switched to the self-report for the health economics data collect collection rather than collecting data from notes. Um, so this is our overall recruitment. It took us about 12 months longer to recruit than we had hoped, but we did reach target um, in the end, um, which is fantastic. Um, you can see our initial, the dotted black line was our um, initial recruitment target. Um, so we kind of were not tracking that line until we brought on board the online recruitment. The online recruitment was really actually fundamental. We wouldn't have got to our recruitment targets without it. I think you can see that um, from this graph here, the Norfolk, London, the North East and Scotland were our physical um, recruitment sites. Norfolk, where I'm based, ha had the best recruitment rates. There's some learning there, perhaps, about trials and recruitment in your local area. Um, but the re remote recruitment using targeted advertising, um, you know, really was as, as successful as our top recruiting physical site. Um, although in the remote site, we kind of, screened many, many more women and had higher dropout. That really helped us to get to our target sample size. So just um, some baseline results. Um, in terms of demographics, uh, women on average aged around 29. Um, most women we recruited um, in the second trimester of pregnancy. Um, Unfortunately, most of our population were white, um, British, ethnic, minority. Many of our trials, we do really struggle to get people of other ethnicities. Actually, it's the smoking prevalence is highest amongst white, white British women in the UK. So I'm probably fairly reflective of the population. 
Um, the key things that are in baseline characteristics, I think, in terms of this population is that 35% of women had a partner who also smoked tobacco, so really a huge challenge for those women. And in terms of e-cigarette use, um, around about 30 to 40 percent um, told us they had used an e-cigarette to help them quit smoking. Um, so the 12 months follow up data we have so far, it seems like we've got quite a high sustained abstinence rate. This is higher than our initial power calculations um, were, were based on. So this is obviously across groups. We don't know if there's an intervention effect yet, but we have 51 percent of women that we've followed up so far have confirmed their smoke-free status. So we've managed to get CO verified outcomes for approximately 86% of the women who told us they were smoke-free at 12 months. In terms of the secondary outcomes, the self-report data, this is a bit higher. So approximately 62% of our population have told us they're smoke-free at 12 months, but we haven't been able to CO verify um, all of those. How am I doing for time? <laughs> So just um, in terms of the process evaluation, this is very hot off the press kind of emergent findings. Um, we had an embedded process evaluation as part of the trial. So this is obviously looking to understand what's going on as well as what the outcomes are eventually going to be. It, it's um, a very uh, thorough process evaluation. So we have collected data from um, the training that we did with health visitors, um, data before and after. We did some audio recordings of intervention contacts to check fidelity and the intervention manual. We've undertaken qualitative interviews with um, practitioners who've delivered the intervention, and then also qualitative interviews with participants, so women across both the intervention and, and control groups. And then we've got quite a lot of data as well on the digital components, so um, usage data in terms of the website, um, the text support and the app use. Um, so just some key headline findings um, in terms of the interpersonal aspect of the intervention, so the health is to delivered aspect, um, women so far have been telling us they really like the tone of the intervention, finding it non-judgmental, having very positive and um, supportive conversations, um, which is great, that's what we intended. Um, but reported levels of helpfulness um, and support did vary. Um, Sometimes, uh, you know, it was squeezed within the health visitor contact and women had perhaps less of a, a dose of the intervention because of the other priorities that health visitors need to focus on. Um, and some of the aspects that we think were not quite so well covered in terms of what we had hoped in terms of the intervention manual were particularly discussion of strategies to help women to avoid relapse. The signposting to other resources wasn't what we'd hoped. Unfortunately, the uptake of the website and the app was really quite low, um, even though we'd hoped the health visitors would, would signpost the women to those resources and help them to engage with those resources if needed. And support for vaping as a smoking cessation or relapse prevention tool was also really variable, despite our information based on the best available evidence at the time, many health visitors are still quite wary about um, advising on using an e-cigarette um, as a way of staying smoke free. Um, so there's just some quotes from some of our participants on screen there, which I, I won't read through. Um, the form of the intervention, this was something that we were able to look at because of the protocol changes we made. So some of the interventions were delivered by health visitors within the routine health visitor visit. Um, and some women really liked that, um, that the in-person visit particularly facilitated involvement of the partner. Health visitors were encouraged to engage with partners as well, talk about supporting the women, but also quitting smoking themselves if, if that was needed. Um, and the potential to utilise the kind of multiple contacts with a health visitor was something that was also really positively received. And then the interventions that were delivered remotely, um, we initially seemed to think that the depth and fidelity of those interventions is actually better because the intervention contacts are specifically to address relapse prevention. So it's a more focused contact, um, but then the downside was not having that in-person face-to-face contact. So there's kind of pros and cons of both approaches, we think. In terms of the use and awareness of other parts of the package, um, the text messages, we've had really good positive feedback on. 
most women um, didn't, they had the option to opt out and stop the text messages, but most of our intervention participants haven't done that. Mostly they were liked, people found it like as having a supportive friend, even though people knew it was an automated system, they felt like there was someone there supporting them and checking in on them. So quite high levels of completion of the text message program. Really sadly, very low uptake of the website and app. Um, some women weren't aware that they existed, that every woman was sent an individual code to log on to the website for the intervention, but some women just hadn't done that. Very upsettingly, some women told us they would have loved an app and would have used it if they'd known about it. <laughs> um, so, and we had very little activity on our online forum as part of the website, you know, which was developed because women told us they wanted to engage with a social support group, but we've, we've only had a few people actually even access that. The baby breathe box, something that is really liked. People love having something physical delivered to them, a gift. Um, the nicotine gum, we've got some data from, from the, the process evaluation that women have used that, taken it out with them in their handbag if they were having a night out, for example. So they had something there and then that they could use. And we've got some quite uh, lovely data on the way in which women have shared some of the, the physical resources with friends or with partners. The ICO monitors. Um, this has been really um, amazing. Um, it, they've worked really well. We developed our own app to take the readings and um, transmit them directly to our database in terms of the research outcomes. But also as part of the intervention, um, we've seen women using them and some women really like them. They find it really motivational to see their carbon monoxide levels have stayed low and they've shared them with partners or with people who smoke and seen how the levels have, have differed. Um, so that's been really um, fascinating to see. Um, so again, I, get, I guess the overarching messages we're getting from the process evaluation so far is that women seem to really like the passive elements of the intervention, the things that just come to them, the baby breathe box and the text messages, the things that need active engagement, like to log on to a website or to download an app, just really low uptake um, and uh, use of those, um, sadly. Um, so general feedback on the whole package, people really seem to like the pick and mix approach, you know, choosing things that they quite like and, and, and not using things that, that they don't like. Um, really importantly, women feeling part of something and not alone, um, not just kind of staying smoke free for themselves, but being part of something bigger, which whether, whether that's a trial effect or, you know, the, the intervention specifically, I'm not sure, but that, that feeling part of something was important. Um, but suggestions about having some additional support, particularly around the six month postpartum point. We do address that a bit in our text messages, but there wasn't a specific focused intervention at six months and perhaps some women would benefit from that because that seems to be a, a key time when relapse happens. Perhaps women stop breastfeeding around six months, weaning's happening, returning to work, all those kind of things happen around that time period. So what's next? Um, final results um, at the end of this year, 2024, um, the process evaluations ongoing. We've nearly done with our qualitative interviews. Really keen to see, you know, how it's been received by their health visiting team, um, teams particularly. Um, and then if we find an effect of the intervention, fingers crossed, um, we really will be working really hard to implement the baby breed as part of the smoke-free maternity pathway to try and um, fill that gap in support that we have in the UK at the moment. Um, so that's it for me. I hope I've left enough time for discussion because I'm really keen to hear all your thoughts and, and how this could work in, in Australia. Um, so thanks very much, Caitlin. That was certainly a, a massive amount of information for us all to absorb. So um, I hope you have questions. Um, but before we get going on questions, I have asked a couple of people to talk to us about whether or how they the feasibility of adapting and what would be required to adapt um, this sort of model to the Australian context. Um, Jacinta and Harriet, did you want to come up or do you want to? Sorry. I'm happy to stay here. I'm happy to stay here. Just, <laughs> just, just, just letting you know I've just turned the four months on. So everyone's really should down the line. And I've got these in back up. I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. There's people on that. There you go. 
right? And then we can have a vote. It's so now I can see it. <laughs> Um, but just so to say, maybe we'll start with you. Um, just thinking about this model, relying on the health visitors and its contacts at say 28 weeks, it's a different model to our model of care. And how, what would it take to be able to adapt something similar to the Australian context? Yeah, so I'm not, so our criminal is dedicated to child family health nurse, which I am not. Um, in that domain as a child -based. Sorry, can everyone online here just in time just checking that the ceiling marks are ready? Anyway, let us know if you can't. I've just had a Yeah. I was just wondering maybe there was some someone online that is a child with family health nurse um, because obviously that first visit, the 28 week, is from the child with family health nurse that could um, comment on that. Do we have any child and family nurses on line? No. Because when did when did child and family health nurses first start seeing? I, I, I am. I am but in Victoria. So it's a bit of a different model, <laughs> potentially. Sure. But I can only speak like for Northern New South Wales. I think it would be a very different model. So I think it'd be hard to get. The yeah. engagement at that 28 week mark. I think they do very well in the postpartum, that initial home visit and then the follow up. But um, I don't know that you get, yeah, it would be difficult. I think there is, well, I know there is some um, different types of models as far as like this program for sustaining new families where the child is only like nurses do see vulnerable families in the age and age period. Um, and then they see them and they continue that continuity of care in the postnatal period. So the context for us it would just it would be about what model of care that um, woman and her family are accessing at the moment. But you know, um, and I I can see that it would work well. Like that's the sort of models with the um, Aboriginal Maternal Infant Health Service. So their midwife, child health nurses, they see the antenatally and postnatally. So they could effectively do that. And the same as um, well in um, Grafton, we've got a first 2,000 days in life, we would be able to do the same because of that model of care. But if they're purely coming to the hospital for their care, I just, I think it'd be opportunistic if they had other children that were attending a child health appointment at 28 weeks. Is it you know, something that should be introduced at 28 and to get I, I think yeah. it'd be great, yeah, like for that continuity and, and you know, of course, these things normally come down to finance and mm -hmm. and that, but, you know, um, the advantage of having that continuity of modelling, as you said, talking to women in the end of period, especially those that have stopped smoking and flagging, you know, that postpartum period is a risk they can hear that message consistently. So I think it would be definitely... Um, and so I should have said fantastic research. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's great. So definitely choose there. I think someone's got their um, their hand up. Uh, Helen, did you want to speak yeah. from the Hi. Yeah, so I'm um, the Maternal and Child Health Policy and Program Lead at Municipal Association of Victoria. Um, so I work with all of the local governments, which is where Victoria predominantly uh, has their um, maternal and child health, so different to other states. Um, there is lots of discussion about other things that would be amazing if we actually had the opportunity to do a visit with women antenatally. And I can see that this is one aspect of multiple things that would be helpful, um, particularly with breastfeeding and a whole lot of other things around continuity that would help women with that transition, especially since our stay in hospital has shortened. So I can see that if something like this got up as a um, as a research study in the country, it would enable us to be providing evidence of a whole lot of other things potentially as well. Um, and I do think that it would have great feasibility um, with a whole lot of the other aspects that we would already have embedded in, in how we provide 
rights service. Uh, so I think the only thing would be that antenatal visit, but um, like the person in the room that was talking about New South Wales, with our enhanced um, service, there is an opportunity to do uh, to do visits antenatally. So I can see for the higher risk um, population, there's probably more opportunity for this sort of thing to be used. And again, in Victoria, the KMS system um, with our Aboriginal um, controlled organisations, I think the KMS into maternal and child health, there would be opportunities there as well. Thanks, Helen. Um, I just wanted Harriet to also speak from a GP perspective and then I'll, I'll come to you. I mean, yeah, I was just thinking from a GP perspective because we do a lot of the, I guess, like antenatal care almost up until that point. It could be something that implemented from our side of things. I guess your whole talk was so amazing and it made me realise just, I guess, like how much we don't think about that postpartum smoking relapse. Um, and it's definitely something that we should be incorporating into our care more and having that ingrained in the antenatal care and constantly asking the questions to these patients. Um, so I guess seeing it from, yeah, I guess, yeah, it, I think it definitely could work over here, but maybe just not having more people involved in that process, I guess, having the GP involved in it, plus the hospital midwives, plus the child family health nurse. Thank you. Sorry, did you want to? Well, that's okay. So, my name is Leanne, and I do great things to stay in New South Wales Families Program. So, we're very fortunate we keep up the women in the age now period, and then we do follow on for the first two years in our um, child's life. So, um, if we are a great opportunity, and I could see that working for a program in my house, since we do have that continuity of care. Okay. I really like the text messages, the, you know, just those copy messages to keep me going and also yeah, I just think like the app and take. So I feel like that would be such an amazing thing, especially for young mums in that initial period where if you're breastfeeding, you're breastfeeding, you've got your phone on you. Yeah. You're kind of there for 45 minutes and that'd be a great resource to do. That's them. so much a part of what yeah. I would develop, yeah, because in our qualitative work, women don't you know. Yeah. Especially the amount of forums that you get your obvious thing. mind down yeah. and you're speeding <laughs> down the rabbit hole. I mean, I think in terms of implementing, well, there's two two things, positive and negative. Um, a positive thing is that you just make yeah, widely available. We, as is this is part of the research trial, we had to limit access to women only in the intervention group to avoid the contamination with the control group. So that's a massive value, and women had to access the website and then install the app yeah. on that website and open the app screen. So that, yeah. that's a huge barrier, yeah. which you wouldn't have in the real world. But a downside is what have we learned about apps <laughs> is they need a lot of maintenance. They're really expensive and complicated. You know, all the time Google's changing its yeah. privacy policies and we need a programmer to kind of constantly maintain that. Um, so in the real world, there's, there's a ongoing maintenance um, a couple of questions, Joe. I think you had your hand up. So, uh, oh, Chris, then Joe. Yeah, yeah. um, so, how much work do you currently do in the program about making relapse? After listening to the presentation, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> as much as we publish it. So, it picked up in the internet, yeah. and then um, it said that we wouldn't answer anything. Yeah, and it's always permission if you like to pay them. Yeah, yeah. So I was actually looking, you know, at, <laughs> I was looking at guidelines from the RICDP today to see what they had on production of like, relapse and yeah. So, so, yeah, it's, no. and the fact that it's 70, around 75% of them. And I think that, you know, regardless of the whole baby we package, which obviously we hope will be implemented, but you know. As healthcare professionals, just a really simple thing we can do is say to women, you know, oh, the questions maybe been staying so free. It was really, you know, it's really heartbreaking, I guess, to hear women say, you know, I've made this change and it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. I did it for my baby. No one ever said that well done. <laughs> so that's a really simple thing that we could all do as healthcare professionals. Thank you.
it's interesting as well as a second component to alcohol as well during pregnancy with the stopping drinking during pregnancy that same behavioral change as soon as baby's out we just start drinking again it's all yeah it's everything i'd like to just ask if there are any questions online or comments or thoughts i don't know michelle if you have anything you'd like to say or others Just um, another comment from Helen saying, I wonder about the involvement with QUIT also, Q-U-I-T. That was from five minutes ago. It's, yeah, so, I mean, that's our, what where we refer people to in regards to um, quitting smoking so I guess your baby breathe pack the adaptation in in Australia would be about what resources we would be forwarding people on to normally as well what other resources are already available for assisting with um stopping smoke cessation of smoking so we do have some other resources already in play we we do we have an equivalent in the UK. We have yeah yeah stop smoking services. So as part of our resources, we do signposts. You know, so if women do relapse, we say you know it doesn't have to mean you know you had a lapse. Doesn't have to mean you go back to smoking. There's this support available to you. Uh, we have really low uptake though of, of the cessation support during pregnancy. You know, as I said, many women, women just don't engage with it that's because of the stigma. Um, so we do offer that referral and give information about that support and for partners as well. Um, but I you know, think we're not taking this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if there's any plan for any intervention around engaging the partners or the, yeah, um, I think you said something like 35% of women. A uh, really good question because it's so important. So we have a leaflet. I didn't really touch on it, but uh, when women come into the trial, they give them a, you know, just an instruction leaflet, and there's a leaflet separately for partners, which is really around how you can support your partner to stay smooth faced. Um, but part of that is the best thing we can do to support your partner is to quit smoking yourself. This will help. So there is that. It's kind of passive engagement with partners by the woman. Um, there are a few other studies that have tried to recruit dyads, you know, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's possibly another study, it's a really important approach. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we have some partner engaging resources, but not. And within the health visitor manual, they're encouraged to engage with the partner when she's present. Yeah, well, they could get the text messages as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah our text messages are just just individually. But because it seems a very individual approach. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's lots of potential. Which we all yeah. Thank you. A great presentation. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I'm just wondering because the British system and the Australian system is quite different from that. Um, health visitor perspective, mm -hmm. and we've heard that we've just got pockets of where the child and family health in Australia might sit, when we say Wales, might sit in. From your development of the protocol and the living, the research, if we didn't have that part, but the child and family health nurses had the education and training and followed that process in the times that they did see them, what level of confidence might we have then that that could be? Yeah, there's a number of different issues there. So I think within baby green, because of the protocol changes due to COVID, we've got we will have some quite interesting data on the remote delivery versus in person. Um we're getting quite big process evaluation feedback on the remote delivery. So we might be able to say remote delivery is just as effective in all <laughs> than, than the health system. And the health business may not want to hear that if that's what we find. <laughs> But if that's the case, then it might suggest that you could deliver this intervention remotely using other trained professionals to, to specifically focus on smoking relapse prevention. Or, and this could happen as well in the UK with implementation, it might be that you target those particularly vulnerable, high-risk populations who, I'm presuming, but 
maybe more likely to be able to back as well for the finish thing like, during pregnancy. So, you know, you might adapt an intervention, particularly for specific groups, and you can target it in that way. That's, I mean, I'd love to see this culturally adapted, but Aboriginal women would be fantastic. But, you know, we might do, we might do that in the UK, depending on where we go with implementation, not be about targeting more kind of animals. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a very I've got another number of questions now. But I'll just... <laughs> it's a very specific question about the app because it is such a shame that that wasn't taken up. And I think you're right; it perhaps was just the, the number of steps that had to be taken to go to the website. Um, did you think about, or perhaps you could do this in future, putting a, a thing in the box itself that says, "Remember to download the app. Scan here." You are download the app, QR code. Yeah, I mean, the leaflets talk about resources. We didn't use a QR code, and maybe yeah. that's just I don't know if QR codes weren't around four years ago. Yeah. So I'm not sure they have it. Have so we do an app on the spot to have a QR yeah. code. Yeah. 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 I think people, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 that was yes, but yeah, anything you can do, you just remove any of the barriers of the hassle. And you've got a baby in the And with the baby, and then they've got so much information, so many, and they're tired, and too many things to do. So anything you can do to make it easier, the better. Um, just in that, sorry, I have a question. Um, what was the training like? What sort of training you got? So, um, Again, initially it was going to be in person training with our teams, but we did it all remotely. Um, and we used some existing resources in the UK. We have the National Centre for Smoking Cessation and Training. We had some modules around um, cessation in pregnancy. So we encouraged our visitors to engage with those modules and to com have completed the baby week and they had to kind of tick off that they'd done those remote modules. We gave them then specific training on a bit of research training or trial because it's really important that they understood what we're trying to do with randomized controlled trials and then intervention specific training so we did have a manual and we talked them through the, you know the way we wanted them to deliver the intervention um and then we did a bit of <laughs> so yeah there was, it was quite intensive it was about half a day online for training in total but health visitors were really engaged with it. They really thought, yeah, this they could see that yes, it is part of my role in thinking about the health of the whole family. Um, they most of them haven't really had any structured training around smoking. So you know, just that how to have the conversation without sort of worrying about ruining the relationship with the woman, that was a big concern. So we we address that and we really appreciated that. And that health visiting services in the UK really rarely get involved in any kind of research tool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so actually that's been amazing. They've really got me with it and really enjoyed being a part of the, the process. Um, but it's been it was hugely challenging because it was COVID our local health visiting service in Norfolk where I am it's at 51% capacity of those so they were really sort of firefighting physics they were doing and, and but they yeah they they did manage to complete the training. Um, and just something with your data, because it seems to be a lot of people randomised to the people that consented in one of your um like slide shows. But was that just how it fell in? Like it seemed to be like a more than 50% randomised for the intervention than those that had consented. <laughs> Yeah, because we consented women to take part in the trial at around 28 weeks. Yeah. Because the first part of the intervention then was delivered just after 28 weeks pregnancy. Um, no, sorry. The drop out from consent, the initial consent early in pregnancy to randomization. We just women just went out of contact. Yeah. 
provided for consent through to being mm -hmm. Yes. And that is the drop out from the time that they were consented there and were meant to be part of the time of the So you can send them back. Yeah. And we did have, you know, the merchants that contacted them and just to keep in touch and try and keep them on board. But I mean, most trials randomize at the time of consent. So this trial is quite different from that. So then we do Okay, but can you tell very much about those women that you lost at that point and how they compared to the women that you ended up with on the trial? Well, a, a lot of our women, we were really just entirely remote, they you remember that, and there's more drop out than those women. It's, it's easy to pick on something and say, yes, but you get to that mm -hmm. reason. So better conversion rates for women that can be to face to face. And like some of them, you need that for smoking. Yeah, doing that point, making them manageable. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. How do you recruit them for that? Is it um, targeted advertising? Yeah. So using Google search terms, mm -hmm. Google search terms for smoking, which we see in the WhatsApp and, and, and Facebook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is gone to be a thought. So officially yeah. we've finished. Those who would like to continue to have conversations, we can gather up in the foyer and we don't that we can, we can continue. Um but I would like to thank you all for coming. And that's it one last really burning critical question. Now in that case, can you all join me in thanking Kayla for an amazing trip? And as I say, you're all welcome to, to meet me. <laughs>